Thank you, Sandra. Hi, my name is Chris Diaz. Uh, I am a sales engineer for Cisco Cloud Security, supporting Cisco Umbrella. I also have with me my colleague, Annie Ballou, who will be fielding questions. So um, during the presentation, feel free to uh, enter your questions in there and she can get to them for you. Um, what we're going to do today is I'm, I have a few slides I want to run through. Um, and then after the presentation, I'll take you into the dashboard and we'll go through a demo of the product. And then we'll open it up for some uh, live Q&A at the end, about 15 minutes. So Umbrella is Cisco's cloud-based DNS security solution. And it works and behaves very differently than your usual security tools. Umbrella provides a first line of defense against threats on the internet wherever users go. <clears throat> Excuse me. By analyzing and learning from internet activity patterns, Umbrella automatically uncovers attackers' infrastructure staged for current and emerging threats and proactively blocks malicious requests before they reach a customer's network or endpoints. With Cisco Umbrella, customers can stop phishing and malware infections earlier, identify already infected devices faster, and prevent data exfiltration. Because Umbrella is built into the foundation of the internet and delivered from the cloud, it provides complete visibility into internet activity across all locations and users. Plus, it's one of the simplest security products to deploy and manage. When we think about traditional security products and how they play into your environment, you, know, you probably have a range of things deployed at different locations like corp headquarters, branch offices, or even roaming laptops. And all of them have a different approach on how to protect your end users daily. Everything from firewalls, proxies, email security, and endpoint products, each having their unique and necessary role to provide defense and depth for you and your users. But it's important to understand that there are many ways malware can get in, which is why you should have multiple layers of security no matter where your users are com connecting from. So where does Umbrella fit? Umbrella sits right here, this very edge of your network, this blue bar. No longer is your firewall the first line of defense. Umbrella is now provides that first line of defense against threats because it operates at the DNS layer, protecting users from connecting to malicious content no matter where they are, and more importantly, before it even reaches your network. DNS is the foundational component of the internet, and it's used by every network device, happens at the beginning of every network transaction. Umbrella is your intelligent recursive DNS resolver that helps enforce decisions on where users should and shouldn't go. It can prevent malicious IP connections, as well as prevent malicious file downloads, regardless of port or protocol. But how does it work? So when Umbrella receives a DNS request, it first identifies which user the request is coming from, and then which a policy to apply. Next, uh, we determine if it's safe or whitelisted, malicious or blacklisted, or risky, uh, and needs un, uh, further inspection. So for the safe request, we just route the connection as usual, and in the malicious request, we'll route the connection to a block page with a brief explanation of why the domain is blocked. For a risky request, we route the connection to our cloud-based selective proxy for deeper inspection. Our selective proxy is different from traditional web proxies, which analyzes your internet, which analyzes all internet requests. This adds latency and also complexity for your end users. Umbrella is only forwarding requests to our selective proxy for domains that may host malicious content. This means that your users aren't subject to the typical performance issues that is associated with proxies offered by other vendors. So what do we mean by risky domains? Most phishing, malware, ransomware, and other threats are hosted at domains that exhibit malicious behavior and are blocked at the domain level straight away. But some domains host malicious and safe content. This is what we consider risky. These often allow users to upload and share content, making them difficult to police. We need more info to accurately determine if these are safe or malicious. So once we receive a query to one of these risky domains, what do we inspect? So starting with the URL inspection, we use Cisco Talus Intelligence and other third-party feeds to determine if a URL is malicious. A customer can also create a list of custom URLs to be blocked based on their policies. And if the disposition is still unknown after URL inspection, 
and the web address is for a web hosted file that matches 150 file types, for example, a PDF, Word doc, uh, an Excel doc, we look at the file reputation. We use AV engines and Cisco advanced malware protection to block malicious files before they're downloaded. Our view of the internet differentiates us from other security providers. Umbrella comes from the Cisco's acquisition of OpenDNS about three and a half years ago. Um, OpenDNS has provided DNS services since 2006, and up to the time we were acquired, we were resolving 75 billion DNS requests a day. Now, with Cisco's reach, we're resolving 175 billion DNS requests a day. So a bit of perspective, um, this is just slightly below what Google is resolving uh, on a daily basis, and they're not even providing security. So how do we differ from vendors providing DNS? Um, we're not only resolving enterprise traffic. So when OpenDNS was founded as a recursive DNS service, free use, it was free to use by anyone um, and still is free to use today. So a key part of our user base is that home user. In a work setting, users know they shouldn't, where they shouldn't and shouldn't go to. Whereas home users will likely be more free to go wherever they want and are more susceptible to clicking on links that are malicious. So our analysts, so we analyze both enterprise and home user traffic, plus the added intelligence of Cisco Talos, AMP for endpoints, and our other partnerships and integrations. We have a proprietary data set that we can mine and protect against current threats, but also predict and prevent potential attacks as well. The Umbrella Global Network includes 30 data centers around the world resolving requests from more than 90 million users and over 160 countries every day. We also appear with over 800 of the top ISPs and CDNs to exchange BGP routes and ensure we're routing requests efficiently and not adding latency. So not only do we have a massive amount of data, but perhaps more importantly, a very diverse data set. So how are we building our unparalleled threat intelligence? But using data, security researchers, and statistical and machine learning models. So let's start with our data. In addition to Umbrella's massive diverse data, we have Cisco Talos feeds of malicious domains and IPs. Based on researchers analysis of millions of malware samples and terabytes of data collected from Cisco deployments worldwide. The second key factor is our security researchers. They look at this data and use advanced techniques like data mining and 3D visualization to identify patterns and are constantly finding new ways to uncover fingerprints that attackers leave behind. And they build statistical and machine learning models to automatically score and classify the data. And lastly, the models I just mentioned, these models continuously run against our data so we can uncover malicious domains, IPs, and URLs before they're even used in attacks. More than using historical reputation scores to look at the specific path, we ingest and analyze both historical and live data against what's currently happening on the internet to help identify and categorize malicious domains with high efficiency. Our research team adds that human intelligence to our already automated statistical analysis. So more than just DNS security, Umbrella is now exposing shadow IT and helping organizations enable healthy cloud adoption with the new app discovery and blocking capabilities. There are three key challenges that we are addressing to help customers expose and manage the shadow IT in their environment. The first one is visibility. How can you develop a cloud adoption strategy and manage risk if you don't even know what applications are in use? Visibility is a critical first step, but it isn't enough on its own. A list of apps is interesting, but hundreds of SaaS apps in, is used in most organizations. The security and IT team need app and risk insight to help understand the vendor, app, and risk details and make informed decisions. All of this detailed information empowers businesses, IT, and security leaders to make informed decisions that improve collaboration and limit risk as they transition to the cloud. Grouping apps by category and reviewing risk profile information helps make selections of which applications to approve 
as well as categories and applications that you want to block. Overall, this visibility and control can help you manage cloud adoption by optimizing productivity, controlling cloud expenses, and reducing the risk to the organization. Umbrella has an API integration for existing solutions and workflows from current Cisco products, third-party partner, and custom in-house to amplify protection. So you can integrate with a threat an analysis feed on malicious domains to act faster on IOCs from things like Cisco Threat Grid, easily integrate from on-premise threat detection security appliances like FireEye, shell, share intelligence from an aggregated source like Anomaly, um, together with a CASB like CloudLock, provide visibility and control access for end usage of SaaS apps. Um, and then we also have custom integrations. So Umbrella supports up to 10 custom integrations with in-house tools. These integrations allow custom scripts to add or remove domains from security categories and enforce different policies on each. The example here that you see is um, a custom integration with the IPS system used by uh, the Bro Frame Network. So you can think of this uh, as being able to uh, extend that on-premise security solution um, to your umbrella deployment, protecting your users as they roam off the company network, uh, even not connected to the VPN. So let's take a look at some of your deployment options. Regardless if your user is on or off network, at home, at the airport, or at a random coffee shop. So you can protect all devices on your network, even those you don't own, simply by registering your egress IP or public, uh, your, your egress IP, and pointing your DNS forwarders to Umbrella. Typically, that takes about five minutes. Customers have several advanced options depending on the level of granularity you need in terms of reporting attribution, or policy enforcement. For example, integrating with Active Directory. We offer a lightweight agent called the Roaming Client that's installed on your endpoints that forwards all requests to the umbrella resolvers, regardless of what, what network you're on. And if you use Cisco AnyConnect for VPN, you can use a, a built-in module to enable roaming security. Because Umbrella is delivered from the cloud, there is no hardware to install or software to manually update, and the browser-based interface provides quick setup and ongoing management. Many customers deploy enterprise-wide in less than 30 minutes. Now, for off-network coverage, we offer a lightweight agent called a Roman client that's installed in your endpoint, and will forward the, uh, all the requests to um, Umbrella resolvers, and that does not require um, that VPN connection uh, to, to enforce. Now that we've completed a high-level overview of Umbrella, um, to get started, we, we offer a 14-day trial. Um, you can go to signup.umbrella.com, and it's easy as pointing your DNS, registering your egress IP in the dashboard, uh, and you can protect your network. So I talked about what Umbrella is, uh, the intelligence that powers our security, and how it fits into your environment. And now I'm going to take you through um, a demo of the dashboard. Just give me a sec as I transition. OK, so when you log into your, your dashboard, what you'll be presented with is this overview page. Now this gives you a, um, a brief check on your deployment. Um, it also gives you uh, a network breakdown of all the requests. So you have your total requests, total blocks, and security blocks. Now the difference between total blocks and security blocks is that the total blocks would also include things that you block from a uh, content category standpoint, as well as items that you have on a block list. We also further break down the security blocks by uh, security category. So we have here malware, phishing, command and control, and crypto mining. Further down, we have um, our app discovery and control. Um, we can show you uh, 
this right here, the flag categories, would be the trend. So uh, in the last 24 hours, we know that this has been trending, anonymizers, P2P games and cloud storage, and then the flag applications as well. So application specific, category specific, and then most block security requests by destination, identity, and by type. This right here is presented in, with, for the last 24 hours, but you can always go and dig down you know, to however you want to um, view this report. Okay. Everything that you'll uh, need is here in this left-hand column, uh, this dark gray area. So from a deployment standpoint, everything is broken down for you uh, here. Um, deploying on your network, again, as easy as add your egress IP here, your, or your public IP here, give it a network name, save that, and then in your DNS forwarders, you're going to change that. Typically, you're setting that, or you're sending your traffic uh, either to Google or to your ISP, um, and instead, we're going, to, we're going to have you point that to umbrella resolvers. Again, the umbrella resolvers are also public recursive, so if you decide to trial umbrella, and at the end decide that you don't want to go with umbrella, um, you don't have to change your resolvers back. The, the, the DNS will continue to work. The roaming client is available here for you to download. We do have a Mac and a, a PC version um, of the, the client. And then if you're using AnyConnect for VPN, we have this roaming module that integrates nicely into the client itself. It would just be an additional tile that sits with the, the VPN client. We support iOS devices as well. So if you uh, issue company um, iOS devices that includes iPads and iPhones, and you manage them with the NDM in uh, supervised mode, uh, we do have uh, a profile available that you can push out for those devices. We have um, an application called the Cisco Security Connector that you would get from the App Store and then this profile um, would be specific to your organization that you can manage those devices. We also have Chromebook support. So if you have Chromebooks in your organization, um, we do have a configuration that um, allows you to also enforce on those, uh, those endpoints. <clears throat> when using the, the Roman client, um, you know, we, uh, as I mentioned, it does forward all traffic to Umbrella. Um, you list out your internal domains here so that when the, the roaming client is on the network, it knows which domains it needs to forward to your internal DNS resolvers. Okay. Now, as far as the Active Directory integration, um, we have all of our components here. There are two methods that you can integrate with Active Directory. One is with the virtual appliance, which is a network conditional DNS forwarder. The second way to, or the second option to integrate with Active Directory is by using the roaming client, okay? We do have a Windows configuration script and a service that would be run on your domain controller that allows the synchronization uh, and then the enforcement of the AD user, okay? Now, when you deploy on your network, from a network standpoint, This is the kind of a report you would see. You would see the, uh, the network name, the domain that was called, and then the public IP that it came from, right? and then what action we took. You also get a timestamp as well. There's a lot of information here that you can pick and choose to view from. When you decide to roll out the roaming client, you'll see it this way. You have the host name instead, um, the domain, also, the, which network it came from. And then when you start to integrate with Active Directory, then you start to see the, oh, let's filter that again. You start to see that the username itself. So you, the username came from. Now, we, this here in particular um, was um, using the virtual appliance. The virtual appliance, again, is that network uh, DNS forward, a conditional forwarder. Um, it has visibility into the IP space, so it can report on the internal IP that the query came from, okay? Um, again, the action that we took, and then the timestamp. So this report that I'm looking at right now, where I'm showing you, 
is the activity search report. This You can consider this as um, just a real-time feed of all the DNS queries that are coming into your environment. Um, you can see here on this left-hand column of the report all the different ways that you can filter this report. And if you find yourself coming into this report, filtering it the same way each time, instead of having to do that, you can filter it once, click on this Schedule button, and then have that delivered into your inbox either daily, weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, however you choose. Okay. And then this report also, again, so we're looking at the last 24 hours, but you can peek into you know, the last several days. You'll give it a custom range. All right? This activity volume report will give you kind of a high-level overview of what's happening on the, from a DNS perspective. So if we can see here all the number of, of blocked requests. We have some command and control. If I wanted to dig into this command and control and see which identities these are coming from, I can pivot right back into the activity search. It filters it for me, and then I can go address this, right? So I know that command and control is usually associated with an infected endpoint, and we need to take care of that right away. Our app discovery report is right here. So this, again, this is that shadow IT that I mentioned earlier. Um, we can see here that I have a, just about 3,000 unreviewed apps. Um, we have reviewed a few and gotten through some of these. But then again, we're showing you the flag categories. These, now these are trending, so these can change over time to, based on the DNS queries that we receive from your user base. And that goes the same for the, the top flagged apps. And then we have um, a graph here that shows you know, um, the trending uh, of how things are going in, in, in the environment. Okay. Now, if I wanted to take a look at some of these applications, I can go ahead and click in here. And then um, sort by risk. And then um, kind of uh, there we go. And then kind of sort by or take a look at the list and then you know dig into some things that you know I want to kind of investigate. Right. I can see here um, mega is risk very high. Um, we can see why we're we're identifying this um, this application as high. Right. So from a user standpoint, it, it looks like it's personal use. Um, web reputation, we have the marker up here where it's poor. Um, and then from a vi uh, financial viability risk, which this, this report here comes from Dun & Bradstreet, so we don't do that, the analysis for this, but we can see it's average, right? If, we were, if this was a, financial, a high financial risk, we might want to reconsider, you know, based on the fact that, you know, what, what, you know if, if, if this vendor is, um, doesn't have a lot of funds, what are they spending their money on? Are they spending money on marketing? Or are they spending money on security? Uh, and then from a usage risk, right, we can see that um, there's, there's a high volume of DNS that's coming from our environment. Uh, if I wanted to dig into uh, where these queries are coming from or who's using the application, I can see here. Right, so this user has 119 um, queries to it. And so maybe I should talk to this user. Right. Um, so these are all the, the identities associated with this application. Now if I choose, I can block this app right away and apply it to a policy. Right? So I can say here that it's not approved, save that, apply it to the policy, and then that's all you need to do. Now from a policy standpoint, all your policies are here. There are five components that really go into a policy. Uh, we have our destination lists, our content categories, application settings, and security settings, oh, and, and then the block page appearance. The way that policies work is it's first in, first out, based on the identity. So I, an identity can be a network, it can be an AD user, um, it can be a roaming client. Um, and so when we order our policies, the way we um, recommend you order them is that policies that apply to an in individual or a limited audience would be at the top and then as you get more um, uh, open and widespread for your policies, they would be um, closer to the bottom. This one default policy is the only policy that you get out of the box with Umbrella. And this policy will automatically protect against command and control, malware, and phishing. 
So as you go to deploy on the network, as soon as you register that egress IP in the dashboard and point your DNS forwarders to, to use Umbrella, that very instance is when you'll be protected. It is that quick. Now, I'll quickly take you through a policy wizard just so you can see how, it, how easy this is. So I'll go ahead and choose uh, one of my AD groups. I'll just say, hey, you know, we're trialing this. I'm going to use my IT staff um, to test this out first. So we'll hit next. And this is what the policy is going to do. Um, umbrella, this is what you're looking for, to Umbrella for, enforcing security at the DNS layer. Okay. We have content filtering, application control, the destination list. This includes black and white listing. And then our intelligent proxy, or our selective proxy I talked about before. All right, you can turn that on, turn it off. It has the ability to do the deeper inspection um, for those risky domains. Right? With our intelligent proxy, if that traffic is, is going to is, is SSL encrypted, we have the ability to decrypt that traffic for the further inspection. Um, you can see here it populated the, the need for the root cert. So you do need the root cert for the SSL decryption piece. And then for um, the roaming client, we do have IP layer enforcement. So if that roaming client is infected with uh, malware that is trying to call out to a direct IP, we can block that direct IP connection if we have a match to a known bad IP. Okay. And then also with the intelligent proxy, you have the ability to inspect files. So if I turn this off, you'll see here that the ins file inspection turn goes away as well. Here's our default security settings. Um, we have di eight different security categories that you can block from. Um, so you can see short descriptions here. Content categories, so out of the box, high, moderate, and low settings, and then you have the ability to create your custom um, content block settings. Okay. You can control applications. So from um, application category standpoint, we can decide we want to block all cloud storage, or if we wanted to just block, say, Google Drive, I will block Google Drive. Okay. Sorry for this. I didn't realize it was going to pause here. So let's just run through this real quick. Sorry for that delay. Um, so the, the security categories, we have our content filtering. We have the application control. Then your black and white listing, right? So the global allow and global block list are the only list that apply to your policies. Um, you can decide to leave those empty if you want and then create your own custom lists. And then the block page appearance. So this is what the, the umbrella block page looks like. Um, you have the ability to customize this however you like. So if you wanted to add your own company logo, have your own messaging, the ability to email um, the IT team uh, because maybe um, they want, they feel like they need to get to a certain site, then you can have that, uh, you can make those changes. And then that's it. You give the policy a name and then you click and drag this in the order that you want it to be um, set to. Okay. The last piece I wanted to talk about was um, investigate. And I didn't talk about investigate in, in um, the presentation. But if we're looking at reports, so if I want to go to activity volume again, I'm saying, I'm seeing that you know we have all this command and control. I click on this command and control, see where the queries are coming from. I'm like, OK. What is this? I, I don't even know what this is. I know it's blocked, but if I, want, I was interested to find out what this domain really is, I can click into View Actions and view this domain in Investigate. And what Investigate is, is basically a peek behind the curtain of Umbrella and what Umbrella is doing with the domain or with the DNS request. And so with that, 
right? We can see that through our, our statistical analysis of this, this DNS request, um, all the information that we were able to capture with this domain, okay? So we know just right off the bat that this domain is on our block list, uh, associated with a potentially unwanted application, um, and also that this domain was created using a domain-generated algorithm. So this DGA, when you see a domain that doesn't make any sense like that, like not natural language, usually, typically, it's, it's a, a DGA-created domain. So it's just a computer um, that's just creating random domains. But we can see here the, the traffic pattern to this domain. There was not much for a while, and then all of a sudden, we see this spike. Um, this usually is indicative of um, malicious behavior, right? You, sometimes, you know, uh, you might have a brand new website that comes up and then there's a spike in traffic because they launched a site. Um, you wouldn't see traffic to a site, a, a, a legitimate site like this, where it's just a constant barrage of DNS queries. You would usually see highs and lows based on the time of day. So when we see something like this, we usually can tell that this is suspicious activity. Uh, we have the who is record data, uh, the name servers that the domain is hosted from. You can also see where um, this domain is, is normally um, clicked from, right? So the United States holds 75% of the users clicking from this domain or for this domain, and then 25% in India. Here's a timeline. So in August, this, this domain was registered, August of 2016. In October of the same year, we uh, it was that's when we first started qu seeing queries to the domain, and then we immediately tagged it as command and control. Okay, uh, and then there are a bunch of different scores that we we take a look at um, to assess the guilt of this domain. Okay, so so with that, um, I know we have a little bit of time. Um, I, I would like to open it up to some questions. So, um, Annie, if there's any yeah. questions. Actually, uh, Chris, well, we did not get any questions. So, oh. Yeah. Um, but maybe one thing maybe you can help answer is, um, is there a way to um, um, integrate Umbrella with a SIM? Yeah. So yeah, there there is there's 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 two ways that um, you can think of how Umbrella can play into your SIM. Um, so one way is the ability to offload your DNS logs from Umbrella, so that you can ingest that into your SIM uh, and get uh, reporting that way. Right. So um, we do have the ability to the way we do it is that we we offload those logs into an Amazon S3 bucket. And then from your SIM, you can ingest those logs. The other way that you can integrate with the SIM is by feeding information. So if you get security products feeding information into your SIM, you got all these IOCs that you want to enforce through Umbrella, um, you would use our um, custom integration um, to um, using an API key um, to enforce those IOCs across your Umbrella deployment. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Yep. Are we sure there are no questions out there? Um, yeah, that we I I didn't see any come in, so I think we're good. Okay. Any closing thoughts, Chris? I'm sorry? Any closing thoughts before we close out the session? Yeah, I, I think, you know, if you're interested um, in seeing what Umbrella can do for you, um, please, you know, we offer a 14-day trial. Our trial licenses, um, we don't hold anything back. So you can go uh, as deep as you want into the deployment of Umbrella. Um, and I think, you know, you'll be surprised of, about the things that you can actually find um, once you see the DNS uh, queries in the reporting. I know for me, 100% of the time, um, I've got customers that are um, really surprised at the stuff that they really didn't know was happening on their networks. 
Um, so again, you can either talk to your, you know, if you work through a partner that you, um, you can go through your partner to um, sign up for a trial, or you can go to, to signup.umbrella.com um, and sign up for a trial that way, and um, we can get you, uh, get you started. Well, if there's no other questions, then I'll thank everybody again today for attending today's Demo Friday. Just a reminder to complete the survey that will open as you exit. Your feedback is very important to us, so we ask that you take a moment to respond to that. Thank you again, and have a great weekend.